Bearing Bibles, turn to the book of 1 Corinthians, the 13th chapter. In the book of 1 Corinthians. Amen. And uh, I'm going to just uh, look at three verses. We're going to look at six verses. But I just want to look at three. I'm not used to sitting down talking. This feel like Bible study. <laughs> Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. 1 Corinthians. Paul's epistle to the saints at Corinth, the first division. Chapter 13. Amen. Verse 1. We'll start at verse 1. When you all have it, y'all stand because y'all y'all have both of your attendants. <laughs> Everybody with two good attendants stand on that side. Praise the Lord. Though I speak with the tongues of men and angels and have not charity, I become a sounding brass or tinkling cymbal. And though I have the gift of prophecy and understand all mysteries and all knowledge, though I have all faith so that I can remove mountains and have not charity, and though I bestow all my goods to feed the poor, and though I give my body to be burned and have not charity, it profited me nothing. The word of the Lord is blessed. Uh, I wanted to First of all, I, I miss, it feels like I've been gone for like 800 weeks. <laughs> Praise God. But I wanted to, uh, first to give some thank yous, I wanted to thank Sister Tishon and our outreach yeah. department, amen, on yesterday's outreach effort. Yeah. Thank everybody who went down there. Put your hands together for, for all, all, all the ladies, brother, we have to make sure we are there with them. Yeah, and praise God. That, that will happen, as the men's department, that will not happen again, Sean. But when our ladies go down, they will not go down there unaccompanied anymore. That will never happen again. Amen. Uh, uh, for all of the saints at Greater Bethesda who, who attended our uh, state convocation, yes. all the saints, I want to thank you guys for that. Amen. For being there. Amen. And representing us. Um, I wanted to thank Sister Shawnee and Sister Duana, our speakers on last week. Woo! Amen. Now, I don't know what happened. The, the tape is mysteriously missing. <laughs> Mission Impossible and sound. What happened to the tape, Duan? You tape everything else, but your turn ain't no tape. Uh, what did the show used to burn up? The tape used to burn up. That's what happened to you. Okay. I'm going to get a hold of it, though. Praise God. And I also wanted to take this time to congratulate all of our honorees, all of our young people. And I will recognize. On that Sunday, Pastor didn't get a chance to tell you how proud he is of each of you. Brother Kareem, a special, we will talk about you in a minute, a little special uh, acknowledgement goes out to Kareem. Amen. Amen. And all that he has done. Amen. Also, I don't see, where's BJ? Oh, I also, I also wanted to, to thank God for uh, uh, my own son, who represented the Greater Bethesda Church in our state ministry of music. This week, we gave the drummer for the state for the weekend, and uh, I praise God. God's doing some mighty things in the life of Brian Keith King Jr. Uh, amen. He's anointed, and uh, all of our young people are anointed, amen. and we give them back to God. Amen. That's the key. Without the gifts and talents that He's given to our young people, we nurture them, we support them, but we give them back to God. Amen. God has made you a brilliant artist to give it back to God, yeah. right? The glory, all of the, the things he does were made to give him glory. Yes. And remember that now. Don't, don't steal God's glory. Amen. Men try to give it to you, don't, but I'll, I'll do that later. <laughs> it's gone. Uh, and, and so, this past week, amen, B. Dad was saying something good about you. Turn around and say hi. <laughs> <laughs> they they're, they're, they're preparing for real thing. Um, This past week, has been I summed up for me in one word, pain. Uh, on last Friday before, Friday before last, I had surgery on my left Achilles tendon. It was reunited and it split. Y'all were here, it, it got split at, uh, here at the picnic. And I had to get it surgically repaired. Didn't seem like it was all that, did it? Be? At the time when it happened, it didn't seem like nothing. Didn't seem like nothing. Kareem was right there. And it was, I was like, didn't seem like anything. But that God just goes to, God's taking this whole instance to show me a lot of things. How, how separation, a little separation, 
could cause a world of pain. Yeah. And all, all that sin is is separation from God. That's what the word sin means. A little separation. Something you don't think is very consequential. Something you might not even notice at the time. As it goes on, it can cause a lot of pain. But there is something to be said about pain. Nothing, as you hear pastors say before, nothing focuses your attention like pain. Nothing can distract you like pain. But nothing focuses your attention like the addition of some pain. And so God allows occasionally pain to come into our lives. And I, so I ask God, I ask the Lord, and this is the wrong time in the summer, we can make it back to school, you know, I got all these things to do. I have all these things that I need to do. Right? And so this would be the exact worst time for a school administrator to be on a scooter. <laughs> Amen. Got my scooter. And, and, and then God said, and so God, you know, I was pounding, pounding. And God said, imagine if you're one of the 8 million people who don't have health insurance. Oh, my God. You will be hurt and broke. Yeah. Said so you already to spend three, four thousand dollars. Imagine. So there's always something to be thankful for yes. in the midst of the pain. Okay. Oh, yes. Uh, so don't lose focus when your heart is hurt. Don't lose focus when your tenderness is severed. Don't lose focus. Mm -hmm. Amen. Amen. And so uh, I'm now in... But for me, Sister Sharon, for me, is the hardest part. And that is the recovery phase. Now, it's not supposed to be hard. <laughs> but for me, it is hard because it requires me to sit still. See, this whole week, for the last 10 days, I've been in the phase doctor called the no weight bearing phase. That means you cannot put no weight as little make minimal amount of weight as you can. Right. And so I thought, okay. I didn't realize how hard that I was. He said, no weight. So I, I was good the first day. <laughs> I laid in the bed, I was watching TV. I was good for them when the boys and all everybody was buzzing around me. Oh, daddy, can I get you old oh, baby you need? <laughs> and I was like, okay, all right. All right. <laughs> Y'all know that ain't that face ain't gonna <laughs> So they go. They people life goes on, people go, and now I'm in the room by myself. <laughs> right? I'm in the room and I, I still can't move. I'm still instructed not to move. Or and, and, and then God put the word intentional in my spirit. And, and I remember the doctor said all movement must be intentional. I'm not you will have to move, but you must be intentional in how you move. And so I said, Lord, I hear you. What are you trying to say? And he asked me to think about how you have moved this past for the last 10 days. Whatever you wanted, my bathroom is about nine, what I thought was nine steps away from the bed. <laughs> but when you cannot put weight on your leg, it feels 900 steps away. Yeah. And so in order to avoid putting pressure on this left foot, I had to do all kinds of things. And God says, Tell the people, make sure they know that it's harder to reconnect than to connect. Oh it's always harder to reconnect something than to connect with it initially. In a relationship, it's much easier to meet them and get good with them at first than it is to have something tear you apart and try to come back. Yes. Huh? So the body works the same way. It's always easier to grow than to reconnect. But in the moving towards me learning how to move and managing movement, in this process, God showed me, he said, this is the same way as, you, as you're moving about. That is how people come to me when they want to reconnect. First thing, first thing I found myself doing literally was crawling. On hands and knees and elbows like a baby, crawling. Places where I used to walk. Didn't think nothing about being there. I would go back 10 hundred times. But now it's intentional. I find myself having to crawl on my hands and knees to get to the simplest places. And that required me to prioritize how badly do I really need to be there. Yes. Every movement had to be intentional because every movement required some effort. Yes. Right? I had to crawl. How bad, my cell phone, how bad do I need a cell phone? <laughs> 
<laughs> That's right, y'all ain't here for me. <laughs> the, phone, the phone was over there with Deacon Jackson. You know what? <laughs> the sanctuaries. <laughs> <laughs> y'all laughing, but it's true. I, I don't want this on any of y'all. But if you've ever been there, you know what I'm saying. When you have to prioritize, is it worth when energy is in short supply? Yes. Is it worth what I'm going to have to do to go over there and get it? Is gossiping with you? Worth me having to get up and crawl, literally crawl. Then, so that was the first I had, had to crawl, and then as I as I elbow I got a little felt like I got a little stronger. I learned how to hop. And of course, I always go to hop. Like that. Right? I began to hop on one leg, trying to get places, trying to reconnect. Now, now, now. Hopping is faster than crawling. And I was good, not good at hopping. But your balance is never as good as you think it is. Right. See, when you hop, the smallest little nudge will knock you down. Yes. Huh? The smallest little thing will knock you down. And the first time I fell, well, many times. First time I fell is when I turned around and tried to look at myself in the mirror. <laughs> while I was hopping. I wanted to see how I looked to myself and down I went. <laughs> God says, see. Y'all, I don't got to tell you. What does that tell you? Well, you have to be intentional. Look what's on the ground. For the first time, I had to pay attention to the ground. Yes. To the stuff that was on the ground. I would trip over things and get mad and then realize it was me. I stripped over my own shoe. Who you will get mad at when you trip over your own shoe? Huh? If everything has a place and everything should be in its place, but sometimes I'm just too tired. Lord, I know that you've called me to do a certain thing, but right now I'm just too tired. Huh? So I'm gonna leave it, I'm gonna leave this undone. You told me to call that sister and speak a word into her life, and I know, but I'm gonna get to it, so I've left it undone. <sighs> but what happens when you trip over your own shoe? Uh, see, we, we, you, you can forget about the shoe when you walk in and step right over it and keep moving, but when it's intentional movement. Hmm? So, so, so I, I, first I crawled, and then I hopped, and then I had to go someplace for real. I had to leave the bedroom, the whole third floor. <laughs> now, I had been on the third floor for a week. I was in my bedroom for a week, just about. I said, at least let me go down to the family room somewhere. Now this required going downstairs. The stairs that I will always remember that I said, I want a house with my whole house. <laughs> when we were picking houses, I said, I want that house with some stairs so I can stand up and I can look out and look down right now. And it seemed like a good idea at the time. But now when you have to go up and down the stairs without one leg, you have to do what they call scooping, which is literally taking your behind and move down the stairs. Now that take, I am tired. By the time I get down the stairs, I have to stop. <laughs> and all I can think about as soon as I get to the bottom is going back up. <laughs> so I'm saying, I'm going back up to the mall. <laughs> <laughs> hey man. But Matthew 11 and 30 says, my yoke is easy and my burden is light. I wish I could have had some help. I, w I wish somebody could have helped carry me. Now, I had people who would help me do things. I ran Paul Cameron to death. Right? I know he's dead. You need to get better and fast. <laughs> ran everybody. Ran my family ragged. But there comes a point where they can't move you. Spiritually, spiritually, my brothers and sisters, there comes a point where can't nobody do it for you. Be, your wife can love you, but there comes a point where you have to carry yourself. The prayers of mom and the prayers of daddy go but so far, but, but it comes a moment, Shelly, when you gotta carry your own self. You gotta figure out how I'm gonna make it move, but I have to move it, amen? And so, the world is looking to us as examples for how to move. Because we live in a world that is totally hurt. We live in a world where everybody has been injured. Your story's not new. You ain't the only one who had a bad mother. You ain't the only one who had an absentee father. You're not the only one who had whatever affliction. Because the Bible says, many are the afflictions of the righteous. Oh, yes. Right? Unfortunately, your story is not unique. 
But in the midst of it, God still expects us to move. And so how will the world learn how to move? With the hurt that they're carrying. They watch the people of God. Whether they say it or not, whether they ever admit it or not, they're watching us to be examples, to be light and salt. Amen. I ain't going back to salt, but I feel that in my spirit. Yeah. Well, they're calling on you to be an example. Calling on me. It's not a job that you were elected to do. Not a job that you're even all that qualified to do. You, it don't matter whether you want to do it or not. You have been chosen. My, my, my. To show this world how we are supposed to move. All right. We don't have no, we don't have no choice in the matter. Mm -hmm. It's not, it's not a, a, an admission that we can choose to accept or not accept. Your neighbors are watching you. Yes. The world is watching you. Yes. Your children are watching you, yes. and they want to see how you move in the midst of all this pain. That's right. Huh? Now, now, when you when you watch TV. For, for a week in a row. <laughs> what you find out, I have three things for sure. <laughs> First of all, the housewives are nasty. All of them. <laughs> Whatever city it is, they're all nasty. <laughs> and after, they all, all the time, black, white, Jersey, Atlanta, Philly, wherever it is, Bitter Road, wherever it is, nasty. <laughs> I learned that for sure. Amen. I, I learned for sure. Now, I'm not trying to go laugh. I learned now, don't laugh. Our president is really crazy. Y'all are laughing. I'm not, I'm not trying to. We should be upset. Are we elected a fool? Show not. Uh, for real. And if you sit there and just watch the decisions and the things that are going on for a week, just watch CNN every day. You almost find yourself looking like, what did he do now? I'm right there. He's like a mischievous puppy. Like, what do you get into now? I can't even go out for five minutes with my shoes. Yeah. <laughs> right? And, and so we have, we have to pray. Because we're, we're in a pickle for sure enough. Yes. Amen. Right? And you'll learn it. Just watch. You get in a little spurt, but you sit there and watch. Right. Like, he's crazy in, in North Korea. He's crazy in New York. He's crazy in Europe. He's cra he just crazy. <laughs> right? Yeah. Yeah. And then you find, so the first thing in the housewives is nasty, the second thing Trump is crazy, and the last thing that I know for sure is that the world needs more love. Yeah. We gotta have some more love. I, I don't know what happened to us, I don't know where, when it came, that little song, what the world needs now is love, more love. We got more love songs and less love demonstration. Yeah. Uh, too much, too much, too much. And so, the, the, John, we, we, Go back to John 4 and 19. I told you they're looking at us. This world that needs love, that's in pain, is looking at us. And John 4 19, one sentence, he says, we love him because he loved us. He first loved us. The reason that we serve God, the reason that we operate in love, is because he loved us. Before, when we weren't even thinking about him, he loved us. Huh? When we had nothing to give him, he loved us. Yes. And so the world is watching the people who say they love God. They ask you, why do you love God? Because he loved us. Yes. Look, love, this, love is in, in short supply, but he loved us. Yes. Why do I work like I do for the Lord? Because he, when I was worthy of nothing, he loved me. Huh? Every time, so when when, you, when when they talk about uh, uh, Greater Bethesda Church being a place where love is lived, if anybody ask ask you why y'all chose that, John four nineteen, because he loved us, and because he loved me, I have a responsibility to love you. Yes. Now, now, in the text, First Corinthians. Well, I'll go ahead before we get. Go to 1 Corinthians 13. 1 Corinthians 13. And, and I, I was on the phone. I did manage to get to the phone at some point. And one of my coworkers, <clears throat> a former coworker of mine, uh, she had called me. And we were talking, and, and she's going through some things in her, in her personal life. Uh, some young ladies, I don't know. She's getting older, and she's not married, and uh, she's having these angst that go along with those things. And I was telling her that Jesus loves you. And we need to focus, my wife was saying that, that we need to focus on Jesus. 
right? And it said, I didn't have no other answer. It wasn't really resonating with her. I, I said, think about how much Jesus loves you. We want to love like Jesus. And she said, make sure I'm saying right. She said, I've been reading and I have been, I've been reading and fasting. But loving Jesus is like drinking from a fire hose. I said, okay. I began to think about that thing. Trying to love the way Jesus loves is like drinking from a fire. So I wanted to talk a little bit about drinking from the fire. Because I know you suburban people. Y'all don't know nothing about this. So I'm going to tell y'all something that y'all don't know. When we were, when I was young, when I was younger, my mother would make us do chores. My brother and I had chores at the house. So we, before we could go out, and we knew the longer it took us to get out, the more chores it was going to be. So when you got outside, you stayed outside. And so when you got thirsty, when you was outside, you would go to the house. Mm -hmm. right. You drank from the garden? Yes. yes. Matter of fact, the water was cool. It was good morning That's in the right. garden. And so I began, that's what I thought about when she said it was that loving like Jesus was like drinking from a fire hose. You would turn the hose on and the water would come out. And can you imagine a fire hose is way bigger than a garden hose? So, so the point she was trying to make uh, is that the, the water that's coming out is too much to receive all at one time. If you left your face in there, you would drown. But she don't know how to drink from the garden hose. You can tell she's out of, outside the bell lane. So she don't know. Because I couldn't understand what the problem was. See, you can drink, you can emulate the love of Christ, but you got to do it like you drink from the... If I was drinking from the fire hose, I would first realize that the most important thing is my position. No, you can't stand in front of the fire hose. Duh. It seemed logical to us, because we met, but they don't know. They would try to stand in front of the fire hose and put their face, and all the water would just smash them on their face and get up in their nose and all that stuff. If you're going to drink from the fire hose, you must position yourself to receive from the fire. Right. You must understand that it doesn't make any difference how, how thirsty you are if you're not in position. Yes. It doesn't make any position how, how much you want to love everybody if you don't put yourself in a position to love. Amen. Yeah. We get, sitting in these pews is not the position of love. Right. I want to be clear. I love seeing you guys. I'm glad everybody's here. This ain't the position of love. When there's homeless people out on the street, yesterday that was the position of love. Huh? And we have to make sure that if we're going to drink from this fire hose, which is the love of God, that we have to position ourselves. And it ain't about you. You're not going to be able to get your whole self in front of the fire hose. You're only going to be able to get a piece in front of the fire. Now, when you get a little technique to it, the next thing you realize, so now you get it so you don't get your clothes all wet and get it beaten, okay? So now, the next thing I realize with this fire hose is if I put my face down there, it's going to drown me. I still come up thirsty. If I try to put my face in where I can see the water and the water can see me, I get nothing and I'm still thirsty. Because it's not about my face. If I try to put my mouth in the fire hose, I'm going to drown show up. So many of us want to have our be seen loving. Oh, we want to have our faces in the picture of loving. Snap a picture of me in here. If it wasn't posted, then it doesn't count. My young people, y'all gotta turn that loose. All this posted, everything in your life, you gotta turn that loose. But I'm okay. The, the. So you can't worry about putting your face what you can see and what you what can see you if you're going to drink from the fire. Huh? Because, because 
If you try to put your mouth on it, it will drown you. So it is with the love of God. If you try to speak it up, it's going to drown you. If you try to talk your way through it, it's going to drown you. Right? After a while, you come to realize, those of us who are expunged, we realize that the way to access the water hose, the fire hose probably, is to take your hand and make a little cup yeah, that's right. and put a cup underneath and slurp it. Now you only give it a little bit. So you might have to go back and do that a bunch of times. Huh? And so that's the way that, that I, it's my hands that move that show the love, not my mouth. It's not the fact that you can see me. I can't access it unless I move my hand. So yeah, yeah, I think she was right. Loving like Jesus is like drinking from a fire hose. I have to use my hands and not my face. Because it's about my position and not my appearance. Oh, all right. huh? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I, I think, okay, I think you might be on to something. I, 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 do, I do think you got it. But, so I go, go back to 1 Corinthians. Because these, these people, these people was at church. And I'm always amazed when I read Corinthians that Paul is talking to church people. Because it sounds like he's talking to sinners. He should be. He's talking about sexual immorality and adult. I shouldn't have to talk about that in church. Thank well, thank you. Amen. See, see, you got to remember the world is going to notice what we do before they hear about what Jesus has done. Yes. We want to witness to the world, but they got to work, they got to watch what we do before they want to hear about what Jesus has done. Huh? And so, these people at Corinth, y'all know about Corinth, Corinth was a city uh, 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 in between two major cities, in between Athens and Sparta, right, on the, on the peninsula, right, and, and people went in and out of Corinth all the time. They had different traders that would come by there and, and, and business, and so Paul established a church at Corinth Two years later, they're writing him letters talking about all the raggedy stuff that's going down in court. And so he writes what's called an epistle, which is a continuous back and forth letter between he and the people, the saints. And he begins in the 13th chapter. We read the beginning because Paul is talking about love, what he called the hymn of love. Right? And most of y'all were here at the wedding. When you go to weddings, people say, love never fails. Right? And you feel like your wife, oh, she, she cuddle up next to you and stuff. <laughs> they real nice to you at weddings. Right? <laughs> be like, babe. <laughs> love is not what it's hold on. <laughs> Suffereth long, envieth not, does not act unseemly. <laughs> At the wet. <laughs> Praise God. But 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 when we get to the spiritual gifts, yes. chapters 12, 13, and 14 talk about the spiritual gifts. But and I wanted to look, look at 13. Because love is a spiritual gift. Mm -hmm. Now you will look when you when, one of the first things you notice is in the King James translation, it says the word charity. But in some other translations, he uses the word love. One of the biggest mistakes that we have ever made, linguistically, theologically, and emotionally, is to account in everything to be love. For some reason, we have attached the word love to a whole lot of things. I love hamburgers. I love the red skin. Right? I love whatever the case might be. So we've been attract, we, but we have reduced love to any strong feeling or attraction that we have. Right. Every attraction that you have ain't love. Amen. Right? Just because you like it, don't mean it's love. Just because it like you back, don't mean it's love. Right? Right. Right. Okay. But we have done that thing, and so this scripture was one of those things, one of those times where they began to put the word love in the place of what God put in there. God, God he, he told Paul to write charity. Right? 
The word is charis, which means giving. Huh? You got to understand now, you got to understand, agape love is the love of God. Pure, unfettered love. Right? Love, love without dissemination, love without restriction, love without division. Right? Charis is when we represent or represent agape love. When we love our brothers the way God loved us, that's called charity. Notice, God loves everybody. He loved the world so much that he loves without any type of dissension. He reigns on the just and the unjust. Yes. He gives his beautiful sunrise to the sinner and the saint. Yes. Right? He doesn't withhold like you and I would do. <laughs> Only those people who, who, obey, who obey me would get sunshine. The rest of y'all would be in the dark. <laughs> Come on now. Amen. Even the people that we say we love. Imagine if God went in the bedroom and slammed the door. Where would you be? He don't do he don't love like we love. Amen. And charity or charis is when we love like God loves. Huh? And, and, and so that's why Paul was very specific in, in chapter 13 when he says charity. He said, he said, if I speak with the tongues of angels and don't have charity, I have become a sounding brass or tinkling cymbal, meaning hollow. If I have all of the spiritual gifts, preaching and teaching and all of those cute things, if I cannot, don't have the representation of the love of God, I have nothing. Hmm. And he goes on and on and, and he talks about the attributes of love. But go with me down to verse 8. Because down here in verse 8 he says, charity never faileth. Yes. Charity never faileth. Yes. But whether there be prophecies, they shall fail. Whether there be tongues, they shall cease. Whether there be knowledge, it shall vanish away. See, when you love like God, you will find that some, some of the things that you thought were going to happen didn't happen. Some of the things that you thought were sure of, you were sure of, you ain't so sure of. When you're really doing what God, amen, had told you to do. Because verse 9 says, For we know in part and we prophesy in part. In other words, we only talk about what we can see. We only talk about what we can see. And so the love that we had, what he says it would fail, or be, the word is called categorio. Cat, where we get the word categorize. What happens is, when we start categorizing the love of God, we weaken it. So that we can understand it, we start categorizing. And that's how man gets in. That's how denominations get in. That's how division gets in, when we start categorizing. Because then we start trying to tell God what he meant. When he said, love everybody. Oh, you meant people that look like me. I'm a categorize. No, no, everybody. Be ye holy, for I am holy. No, you meant the preacher. No, I said ye. <laughs> no, you, you, know, you meant the married folk. No, ye. We try to categorio to move things. And that word means categorio means to make inoperative. Because we have divided so much, now it don't even fit no more. Uh, verse 10. But when that which is perfect is come, then that which is in part shall be done away. I can't wait, personal, I can't wait for Jesus to come back. I want him to come back because I got some questions that I want to ask. And I say, Jesus, did you really mean Jesus, did you? He's going to say, what did I say? I don't have to repeat myself. I meant what I said. I lived what I said. Did you do what I said? That's what we do. I meant what I said. I said what I said. Are you going to live what I said? Amen. And, 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 and so, instead, when Jesus comes back, all of the prophetic will be accomplished. All the stuff that people said, oh, this is going to happen, that's going to come, and that, it will be done. 
So he said, we only knew in part. So we only talked about what we knew, and we only knew a part of it. How many of us, <laughs> when you were younger, you thought you knew everything? <laughs> huh? Sister Charmaine, uh, see, I, I know Sister Charmaine since so she was actually younger in grade school. <laughs> that was my little smart Sunday school. <laughs> I always call my Sister Charmaine. Right, right now, now, think about it. How much smarter are you now than you were then? <laughs> you got to see, I, aging, no, 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 11, 11, 11. When I was a child, I spake as a child. I understood as a child. I thought as a child. But when I became a man, I put away childish things. Why would he say this when he's talking about love? It ain't by accident. We got to stop loving like children. My God, my God, my God. He said, when I was a child, I talked like a child. Because I thought like a child. But when I reached the point of, of manhood, I had to put away childish things. The problem is, a lot of us look like men, but we still got childish things. My God. God, said, God does everything in process. And we understand that you cannot be, a, a apple will not be fruitful until it's reached the point in the process where it bears seed. A man will not be profitable until he reaches the point where he can bear seed. And that is called maturing. Yes. The cost of maturing is age. <laughs> Tell you, great hair is cost. Yes. Seems like they cost more to get rid of them, praise God. <laughs> Gray hairs cost you something. If you say, I, I, I'm glad I know now. How many of you have ever said, if I only knew back yes, then? Yes, yes. But I, if I would have known even a half of what I know now, back then, I'd have done some things different. I, I'd have took some opportunities different. I'd have took advantage of some things and left some things alone. But it cost me some gray hair. Yes, yes. I had to mature. Uh, until the point where I could bear seed. I had to, and the first thing I had to put away, childish things. Yes. Love is not child's play. My God, my God. A whole lot of times, see, Disney done made us think love is child's play. And we talk about puppy love and all this kind of stuff. But love is not for children. Amen, that's right. That's right. Not this kind of love, not Charisse. We're not talking about children love. We're not talking about holding hands and uh, put the box yes or no, do you like me? <laughs> like we used to do, write my name on the wall and stuff. No, 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 no. We're talking about loving the way that God loves us. Unconditionally. Like I tell all the brothers, there is a difference, all my single brothers, there is a difference between a wife and a girlfriend. Even a really, really good girlfriend. It's like the difference between a big dog and a little wolf. <laughs> they look kind of alike. But a wolf is a whole separate animal. Poke a stick at a dog and, and you know, you might run away. You don't poke no stick at no wolf. A wife is a different expectation. Yes, that's right. Requires different handling. Because it's not child's play. Right. Because once you said you were going to marry this girl, now you gotta love her like God loves her. Now, now you were in 1 Corinthians 13, love. You had to not call me back, love. <laughs> wait, 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 where you at? You, you, you ain't there spending the rent money on, on Redskins tickets, love. What? No, 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 you got to love like God loves. That's what you said you was going to do when you told this woman that you were going to take her as your bride. Because love ain't child's play. When I was a child, I could write your name. Courtney put her picture up. <laughs> Kings Dominion, you had the same shirt. So. <laughs> right? And that was cute. And those things, we smile at that stuff. But you ain't married. That's right. right. You better oh, preach, Pastor. Hold on. I don't wonder how many married folk. The married folks is the ones sitting on the bench. That kicks the biggest time. Y'all go ahead on, I'ma hold the bag. Y'all go ahead on, ride the ride. <laughs> That's the husband. 
The boyfriend's still trying to bang the thing and when, when do you some hitting the ham on the thing? I'm like, I'm gonna get it back, I'm gonna get it. I'm gonna get it good there. I'm gonna bang it. How long will y'all be staying? My boyfriend will stay there for a long time. Trying to win you. I was understanding only part of this bride. Yes. The part that made her smile. Yes. Right? So I wanted to see that smile. So I did things to make her smile. I didn't understand that she's still my bride, but she's crying. Yes. That is just as important because God understands the things that make us smile, but he also understands the things that make us cry. Then can you love her with tears coming down her face? Yes. Huh? Can you love her when she is really down on your nerves? <laughs> Not that that ever happens to me. <laughs> to those two who have got. That's the mature kind of love. That told you love ain't child's play. That's right, that's right, Pastor. Can, you don't love somebody until you forgive them. That's right. Amen. That's only got that many amens? Amen. Okay, <laughs> You know they love you when they forgive you. Amen. Have you ever forgiven somebody who was all the way wrong? Yes. Why are you saying on faith? <laughs> That's how you know that, and, and the reason, you know why you forgive people? Why you forgive that one who's come falling short of your expectation? Because you fell short of theirs. Yes. Because you loved me first. I told you we loved like he did. Yes. Right? And so then we go on, we keep going, keep going. And now, verse 12, I'm almost finished here. He says, For now we see through a glass darkly, but then face to face. Now I know in part, but then shall I know even as I also am known. That, that, that word glass, the, the, the interesting part that is esotron, and that means mirror. Mm. He, he, he said, Now we see through a mirror. Darkly. Right? When you, when you stop seeing through the mirror, when you stop seeing love through the mirror and start seeing love through the window. That was supposed to be deep. Y'all supposed to be saying, yeah. Hey, see, I, I, in the mirror is a reflection. I was supposed to show you you. Right, Sean? So, in other words, if you only see love in reflection of yourself, Right. Instead of seeing God, has God ever seen his reflection? Mm. Y'all supposed to say, yeah, when he looks at my life. My, 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 my. Uh, he's supposed to see his giving when he looks at Sean William. That's right. Oh. My serenity, has God ever seen love? Yes, he saw when he looked down upon you. That's what we're supposed to say. But he said, uh, we look through a mirror darkly. Huh? I, well, now when I look down and I see myself, I see a warped perception of myself. And I expect you to love the warped me. We're expecting the world to love an us that we don't even love. If we tell the whole truth, it'd be times we don't even can't stand hardly our own self. But yet I expect you to accept things that I don't accept about myself. My single brothers again. Marry the girl who will not accept your junk. That's right. Ma Rock, no pants. Okay, put it on your phones. <laughs> Marry the woman who will not accept the junk that you throw up. Right? She's gonna make you better. Yes. Right? Because when you stop get when you when she becomes a reflection of God's love, and you see that God don't want your junk either. God don't want you half-stepping in studying his word. God don't want you half-stepping in attending his, his uh, a meeting. God don't want you half-stepping in prayer and fasting. So don't marry nobody. Don't associate yourselves with people who will allow you to do that. You know what God has called you to do. Well, are you looking through the mirror darkly? Because then he says, and we, we, he said, 
But then face to face, ain't gonna be no more mirror. After a while, we're gonna get intimate. Huh? Face to face. You're gonna be face to face with the Lord Jesus one day. Huh? And he's gonna look at the way you love. There's nothing better than being face to face with somebody you've been true to. My God, amen. Ah, my God. So nothing better than when my, when my brother asked me, why does my wife look through my phone? I said this once before and people look at me crazy. Your wife knows your passcode? Yeah. Uh -huh. Now, I'm not telling what y'all to do. But I ain't got no problem with it. Because there's nothing there she can't see. That just said, lady, y'all got passcodes too. <laughs> Praise God. <laughs> I, I was watching TV this weekend in North Carolina. A man, a, a, a man sued his wife, took a boyfriend and, and left him for a boyfriend. And the man sued the boyfriend for $9 million and won the case. Because they have, oh, I forget what it's called, the, yeah. I forget what the thing is. But it's a thing where in North Carolina, if you take my wife, if you kind of slick and slick up my wife, and then my wife leave me and break up our happy home, I can take you to court for $9 million. Guess what? Be a whole lot less tipping. Because I told you in the morning, when, when your movements have pain, she not $9 million fine. I know that. I, she could be fine. $9 million? Yo. Y'all make a beautiful couple. Y'all really do. Huh? And I began to think, so see, when I saw that, I was laughing a little bit, and then God said, see, I had to put a monetary yeah. amount on my commandment. Yeah. I said, thou shalt not commit adultery, but that wasn't enough. So I just say, nine million dollars? Yes. Oh. oh, you recognize that? <laughs> if I said eternal damnation, you didn't recognize that. But I said, I put, because I put nine million dollars, now it's worth it to you. What has, what has happened to our oaths? Oh what has happened to our word? What has happened to our yay being yay and our nay being nay? Because when we stop looking through this glass darkly and we start looking face to face huh, with Jesus, he said, and I, he said, shall I know even as I also am known? Because not only will you see Jesus, but Jesus is going to see you. And now, verse 13, now abideth faith, hope, and charity. Spiritual gifts now. Now, after all, that, after all that's done, what we have left over is charity. Representing the love of God. Faith and hope. And he goes on to say, but the greatest of these is charity. The, the, the greatest of, of all the things we can do is represent God. So we have to drink from the fire hose. God wants us, yes, he's pouring out blessings in fire hose amounts. Yes. yes, he's pouring out anointing in fire hose amounts. And a lot of people, even in this room, we're intimidated in our walk with God. And so the devil's trying to tell you, you can't do it. It's too much for you. There's too many things to remember. Too many, ah, too many ifs and ands and don'ts and thou shalls and thou can'ts. God's saying, just put your hand under the hose. I don't expect you to drink everything, just enough to feed your thirst. The water that you can't drink wasn't for you. He said, stop staying away from the hose, trying to avoid it. Uh, you're you're going to thirst to death right in front of the fire hose. Yeah, you're right. It's a lot. It's a lot to think about. It's a lot to do, but it's worth it. And to not have this living water is to die. Every animal must have this living water. And guess what? After you drink it up and drink it up and drink it up and put your hand in there enough, then you go away and out of your belly shall come rivers of living water. 
That's where God wants each of us. Huh? He wants us to stop being afraid. Stop being afraid to love. Stop being afraid to try. Stop being afraid to take the risk. For he's waiting for you. He's not trying to overwhelm you. Don't worry about what we say. Don't worry about what the preacher says. You got it. Send me this much money and do this many things and say this many Hail Marys and whatever it is. No, no. Just put your head yes, yes. under the water. Ain't no technique. I didn't say which hand to put in or, or which. Just put your hand in the water. Huh? Take one sip at a time. If you have a question, seek to get that question answered. That question that's been on your heart for all that long time. First, let's seek to get that answer, question answered first. Huh? That question about marriage. That question about tithing. That question about whatever it is that might be. Because the devil lets these little yes. rocks yes. stand in the way of a beautiful relationship. Yes. Amen. Yes. Is there one place I'm so close? 